God, we thank You for who You are. We thank You that You love us no matter what. God, thank You for the promises that we have in You. We glorify You tonight in Jesus' Name. Amen. You guys can take a seat. Uh, I am super excited for what we have coming up tonight. Uh, you may notice in the front row, we've got a few guests here tonight. Uh, would you welcome up Jake Too Good from House Youth? All the way from Murray Bridge. All the way. All Hello, the way. everybody. How you going? All okay. the way down the freeway, you made the trek. Yes, it's, it's been a while. It took a couple hours. Yeah, a couple hours now. There yeah, you go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, awesome. Uh, who's loving Jake's hat? I'm loving his New York Knicks hat. Anyone Who, else loving that? Who's a Knicks that? fan? Man, uh, sorry. Not many out there. That's yeah, all right. We didn't do too well this year. <laughs> that's right. Terrible. Jake, would you just be able to tell us a little bit about yourself before we kick it off? Uh, well, can anyone firstly just want to take a stab at about how old I am? Because someone literally yesterday said that I was 33 and I cried, <laughs> I cried myself to sleep. Who wants to chuck it out? 15. <laughs> you owe me five bucks. How much? 28. Man, dang. Okay. Uh, anyone else feel like they're correct? I'll, I'll legitimately give somebody $3.40. $3.40? No, no, I, I, want, I want the first person to just put both hands up and then, I, there. Ah. No, nah, I'm 22. Um, yeah, okay, <laughs> you can stop bullying me now. I'm 22, I live in Murray Bridge and we actually have an accent in Murray Bridge. I want you guys to say Murray Bridge the way that we say it. Okay, ready? Say, Murray Bridge. Ready? One, two, three. Murray Bridge. That's how we talk. I grew up there all my life, uh, became a pastor when I was... 18 years old and that's what we're doing here we're believing that God is amazing that's what I live my life uh, after and I'm believing that he's going to do some amazing stuff tonight who believes that come on who's with me amen uh, and something exciting's happened recently in your life Th that is correct I uh I recently am engaged so Woo! that's exciting uh, my soon to be wife is running our youth ministry in Murray Bridge House Youth. She's amazing, very attractive. Don't hit on her if you're an older male because she's uh, taken. Uh, soon to be Mrs. Too Good. I love that yes. last name. What a great last name. Too yeah. Good. It's got love its ups that. and downs for sure. Can I pray for you, Jake, before we kick it off? Please do. God, we just thank you for who you are. I just want to lift up Jake tonight. I just pray you give him a spirit of boldness. Thank you for the words that you've placed in his heart. God, we pray for lives to be changed tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. What's happening now? Do I miss that bit? Hello. Awesome. So I just get into it. Amazing. Well, before I get into it, can we just all stand up in this place right now? Come on, from the front to the back, if you're able. If you're able, of course. I know that a lot of us kind of feel like we're about 80 sometimes, but it's Friday. Come on, we can let loose a bit. Why don't you just start to get loose right now? Come on, get loose. Man, I love Excess Youth. I love this place. And what I'm believing tonight is that we encounter the living God in this place. You know, God is not just this figure that we idolise in a book, but God is alive and He's moving tonight. And what I wanted to do before I get into my message, I'm talking about a pretty big word called evangelism, okay? Everyone say evangelism. Evangelism, evangelism is basically having a spirit that says, I don't live for myself, but I live to, to, to make Jesus known to everybody else. I don't just live for myself, I live to make Jesus known to everybody else. And I believe, and I don't know if I've got some friends in here as well, but I believe that God can legitimately change people's lives. I believe He can change situations, change people's circumstance, but it first comes from having an encounter with Him. So what I wanted to do is I'm only gonna be up here for a couple minutes uh, preaching some life transformating power that comes from the Gospel. But before I do that, is I believe that there's a key indicator on people that are ready to receive something, and that's their posture. Someone's posture that can come into a church is, oh, I've seen it all before. Oh, I've come to youth every week. I know it's, we sing the songs, we sit down, we go home, we play a bit of handball, we get some free bakery, which is amazing. But do I have some friends with me that says, you know what, I don't wanna just stop at that. I don't wanna just be content with that life, but I actually wanna access the living God tonight. I want to see something break over my life. So what we're going to do is we're about to sing. If I can have the band just build up behind me. And I want us to make a statement tonight that says, you know what, whatever atmosphere I came in here with, whatever agenda I came in here with, whatever thoughts I've got about tonight, 
I just lay it aside because I just want more of Him. So if that's you, why don't you just lift your hands up to heaven right now. We're about to sing. And as we sing, why don't you just declare it? Why don't you prophesy over tonight? Come on, Ben, why don't you lead us right now? Come on, start to sing. Come on, lift your voice tonight. Lord, have your way. Lord, have your way. Lord, have your way. some young people's lives that are going to be impacted tonight. I really believe that. I feel that with all my heart. And what the reason why we're doing this at the start of the message is because it's like, no, no, we're not going to get into God no matter how funny this white guy yelling at me is. Or well, I don't want to respond to Jesus because of what I'm seeing here. I actually want my heart to say, I'm not here for any other reason but to live out a life filled with purpose because God saved me. He set me free. And I really believe that tonight... I can say some funny things. I could do I could do anything. But it's actually not about me. It's not about this. It's about him. It's about Jesus Christ. So one time, come on, let's just give it up for Jesus in this place. Come on, the King of Kings. The Lord of Lords. We worship you, God. We worship you. Praise you. One other thing while I got these guys up here with me is I'm gonna be preaching from the Bible. Who loves the Bible? Now what what we do in Murray Bridge is we lose our teeth. But not only that, when I say a verse in the Bible, everyone's going to stand up and go crazy. Okay, so everyone, why don't you take your seats right now and we're just going to... Right, I'm, I'm going to keep you to that, okay? I'm going to keep you to that. I'll show you what it looks like. So let's say, let's say, you know, the Bible. Someone just says a Bible verse. What's a Bible verse? Okay, so let's go. Someone, okay. When I go, eh, eh, everyone's going to go like crazy, right? So I'm just going, yeah, God is so good. All right, eh. Yeah. We're getting there. We're getting there. All right. Hallelujah. We're getting there. Yes. It's going to be a fun night. Who's excited to be at Excess Youth tonight? Yes. Yes, we are. Uh, who is super spiritual and writes notes? Yeah. Everyone's just putting both hands up. Man, amazing. What journal do you have? What sort of book you got? Oh, I like that. I like that. That's a nice journal. Let's give it up for her journal, everyone. That's amazing. That's the best journal I've ever seen in my life. Now, I would take notes as well, but I'm dyslexic. So, come on, i got a dyslexic brother over here. Who's that? How hard is it? It's like, what, what does, how do you even read? It's like, reading is tricky. Um, 
So that's why I don't, that's why I don't write uh, notes because I can't, I can't read and write at the same time. It's quite tricky. Anyway, enough about my shortcomings. Uh, I'm so excited to be here. And I know that this room it gets crazy sometimes. I've, I've, heard the, I've heard the stories. This room gets passionate. It gets ridiculous. Um, and the reason why I'm here tonight is because I love you guys. I love your youth pastor, Pastor Matt. Let's give it up for Pastor Matt. Um, but not only that, I love the hills. I love this place that we get to meet. I love this, this area. It's amazing. And what I believe is that God is going to use you tonight to reach your friends in your school for Jesus Christ. You know, especially in this world with the pandemic and all of the social justice issues that's going on right now, what we need is we don't need more good ideas. We don't need more cool quotes on TikTok or whatever you use. We need the power of God. We need the truth of Jesus. We need Him like ever before. And what I believe is that tonight as we're talking about evangelism is that we're going to catch something tonight, not coronavirus, because we got the marshal at the back. We're not going to catch COVID-19. We're going to catch Jesus Christ. We're going to catch Him more in our lives. So that's my prayer for tonight. Um, I said I'm dyslexic, but another thing about me is I sucked at school. <laughs> Man, I loved it. I got some friends. I got a dyslexic brother over here. I got someone that sucked at school. This is amazing. You got an amazing journal. Um, I sucked at school so much that when the wrong thing, like imagine in class, noise happens, people turn around, everyone just assumes it was me. I'm that sort of guy. I just used to, you know, who's with me? Who's a bit of a class clown? Yep. Guess oh, Okay, boys. Okay, boys. All right. And some girls. Okay. Well, I was pretty shocking. Um, oh, I got some of my friends with me as well. Why don't you guys stand up? I got, I got Mitch and Tegan. Come on, let's give it up for these guys. From House Youth. We get, we get free, free bakery here, but why don't you shout them some bakery or something like that. Anyway, I went to school with Mitchell so he can testify to all this stuff. Um, I was not the best at school, okay? I did, I did some interesting things. I came up with some pranks. Uh, my brother's an IT guy, so he's like right into computers and CDs. I don't know. Do people listen to those? Blu-ray discs. Who knows what a Blu-ray is? Oh, my goodness. This is ridiculous. Um, anyway, he's right into this stuff. And what he did is him and his friends came up with this USB that if you plug it into a computer, like a school laptop, it opens a disc tray like this. It goes... Um, so I took that off his desk one night. I just put it onto a bunch of my friends' laptops and everything's going great. So I'm that sort of guy, right? One thing I noticed about school was sometimes in a lesson like English or something, um, there's these things called group assignments. Do, do they still do them? I sound so old. I'm literally only 22, not 28. 22. Um, but they do group assignments. Who loves group assignments? Okay, I'm watching you. Okay, I bet you I know why you like group assignments. Because it's an excuse for you to do nothing. Okay, let's be honest. Let's be honest. Group assignments are an excuse for you to sit there. Okay, I'm not doing anything, but I'm going to get the grade for it. You know what I'm saying? There's a couple people in group assignments. I'm going to lay them out right now. And if you're one of these people, as I say them, I want you to stand up if you're bold enough. So there's a couple people in this group assignment scenario. There's a person that doesn't do anything. Okay, okay. Stay up, stay up. If you've, if you've, get up, get up. There's the people that complain about the people that do nothing. There's people that do everything. They do the whole thing. There's people that don't rock up. And then there's people that go to homeschool and they don't have group assignments. I'll tell you that much for free. All right, you guys can sit down. Can anyone guess what I was? I did everything, man. Nah, just kidding. I uh, did absolutely nothing. And the reason why I loved it is because my, um, 
report card was just literally just C's and D's. Just CDs, you know what I'm saying? My brother loves CDs. I love CDs as well, you know what I'm saying? Can't get enough of them. Uh, not only did it say CD a lot, but it said distracted others, easily distracted. Who's one of them? Jeepers. This is getting intense. Well, all right, all right. Hey, you're standing up again. Hallelujah. What happened to your arm? Is your arm all right? What happened to it? You, you sneezed on it. Yeah, I know you injured it, but how did you injure it? He stacked it. Doing a TikTok dance, probably. Yeah, you boys look like TikTok boys. E-boys. Anyway, so with group assignments, I sucked. I was, I was awful. In fact, I didn't rock up. I used to complain about the other people not doing anything. Like, oh, these guys are just wasting our time. And then I would just do nothing. So uh, it was not good. Um, but then there's a person that I didn't mention, and they're your best friend, right? They're just amazing. They, they love you. They think, hey, you're amazing. Let me walk you to your locker. Let me do all that stuff. And then when you get them in a group assignment, they are the worst. They are the control freaks. Like, you, <laughs> who's sitting next to one of them? Nah, don't put your hand. Okay, people, their hands are going up all over the place. They're your buddy, and then they turn into your boss. It's like, oh, no, I didn't sign up for this. You know, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. My message tonight is called, Don't Stop at Saved. Don't Stop at Saved. And tonight I'm going to be talking to you guys. Hey, there might be some Christians in the house, which is amazing. There might be people in the house that haven't made that decision yet. That's amazing. Hey, thank you so much for being here, even though you don't necessarily believe everything just yet. But the reason why I've called it Don't Stop It Saved is because I believe that we unintentionally switch off some things once we become a Christian or once we become uh, someone that rocks up to youth regularly. And one of these things is what I'm talking about in a group assignment. And, how, and let me explain that right now. Just like me, didn't do anything, had a really good friend, super nice. We get in a group assignment situation, they are awful. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm not handing my work up to the teacher, I need to submit it to this person. They're like that sort of guy. One of the things that we can do as Christians that are recently saved or we're putting our hands up, we're responding to the altar call, it's amazing, we become a Christian, is something kind of shifts in our hearts unintentionally, I believe. Where we come into youth, and it's like, man, Jesus is amazing. He's, he's our friend. He, he's our brother. It actually says in the Bible, I'm going to test you guys on what I talked about before. In John 15, 13, verse 15. Oh! We love the Bible. You can take your seats. Amazing. Get this. Now, I'm legitimately dyslexic. It's not a thing I say just because it's cool, because it's, it's definitely not cool. You know what I'm saying. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. You are my friends, if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know what his master's business is. Instead, I have called you friends. And what can happen when we come into youth is we're like, man, Jesus is amazing. He's unreal. He's, he saved me. He's, he's my brother. He's my friend. But then when we make that decision to follow Him, maybe unintentionally, instead of seeing Jesus as our brother, we see Him as our boss. And first we're like, Jesus, I thank You so much that when You, when you came down here, You, you saved me, you, you set me free from my sin, from my shame. You're amazing. And then we leave this room and it's like, man, well, Jesus is just a bunch of rules. He's just telling me what to do all the time. Man, I feel like I'm not good enough. I feel like I'm not this. Well, I believe that the first thing that's, that does not stop it saved is Jesus is still our brother. He is still our friend. Come on, He is still with us. He is still for us. He's not against us. He is our friend. One of the things that I believe that stops when we get saved is we feel like He's not our friend anymore. He feels like He's not our brother anymore. He feels like He's not as close. And I'm going to be naming a couple things. I'm not saying this is for everybody, but I'm just, I want to list off a couple things that might stop when we get saved. And I just want to speak over someone's life. Maybe you're here and you're feeling like that. Maybe you you put your hands up one week or you open up your Bible one week and in your heart you had a transformation and then a couple of days later you're stuffed up and you're like, man, whew, 
man, Jesus, like I know that you love me, but I don't want you to, I don't want you to be distant from me. I don't want you to be bad at me. I don't want you to have anything against me. Can I encourage you right now? that Jesus does not leave your side, that, de- that Jesus is not scared of your sin, that Jesus does not look away when things are going bad, but Jesus loves you so much that He's that he, on the cross, He's like, you know what? I know these people are going to hurt me. I know that these people are going to do the wrong thing sometime, but His love doesn't stop. His love does not stop when you get saved. His love is for you when you get saved on Friday. It's for you when you wake up on a Saturday. It's for you on a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Jesus' love never stops. It never stops. Jesus is not your boss. He's your brother. He's your friend. Come on, in your heart right now, who's here saying, man, I feel like he's my boss. I feel like I've got some things that I need to go to Jesus about and he's he's not very happy with me at the moment. He's proud of you. He loves you. His brotherhood doesn't stop when you're saved. Man, we're getting real but we're going to lighten it up because in Luke 15. Luke 15. Luke 15. I'm dyslexic. I've said that a lot. So I'm not going to go crazy into this because there's a lot of writing. But who actually, who loves Jesus so much? You know what Luke 15 is just right now. You're just like, I know what that is. That's all right. Hey, we're getting there. We're getting there. I thought it said Luke 51 for so long because of my brain, but basically what Jesus was doing, and, and he used to do this all the time. He used to share these things called parables. He used to speak in stories so that people could understand what he was saying more because he was so countercultural. He was so like saying all these things. And everyone's like, what are you talking about? Um, so he's basically talking to a bunch of these tax collectors, a bunch of sinners, it says. It says all this stuff. And it goes down into verse 3. It says, that Jesus told them about a parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that it is the same way there. I'm dyslexic. Something about rejoicing, 99, hallelujah. Yeah. This story that Jesus is saying, who's heard that before, by the way? Obviously read out properly because someone can probably read it. (laughs) Um, Who here reads that and goes, man, this is amazing. Like, Jesus, our Savior, he, He goes after the lost. He goes after the broken. He goes after the one that went astray. He goes after the one that can't find their way back. He goes after the one he does. Actually, let me preach that right now. God goes after the one that is lost. He goes after the one that can't find their way back. He goes after the one. Come on, we can get a bit excited about this. He goes after the ones that can't make it back on their own. And you know, the reason why I think it's so symbolic that he actually put the sheep, the lamb or whatever it was on his shoulders is because maybe sometimes people can't feel like they can walk back to the rest of the sheep on their own. Maybe we do need Jesus to come back. And, and I love that Jesus does that. And as I was talking to, talking to God about evangelism and about how we can be used to reach our friends for Jesus Christ, He's the best cause. He's amazing. I'm thinking about this verse and I'm looking at that and I'm like, man, what's wrong with that sheep? Why would they leave the 99? Why would they jump over that fence or whatever sheep do? They like squeeze their way through the fence actually. Have you seen a sheep? trying to escape a pen before it's a mess there's a video on YouTube it's like like trying to get through the sorry I don't know where that came from they don't leap gracefully anyway I'm I'm thinking about I'm like what's wrong with this sheep what's wrong with this dumb sheep trying to leave this thing Jesus is there 99 people are there it's amazing this is unreal and I'm thinking about that and then I was like kind of talking to God about evangelism and I'm like usually when we look at this story we identify as the one that ran away, right? And like I said at the start, maybe you're here and you feel like the brotherhood of Jesus has actually been something that you forgot about and you see Him as this distant God and maybe you're making mistakes at school, at home. You're doing things that you know you shouldn't be doing that you're too afraid to go to God. Maybe you've actually jumped out of the pen and you identify with His sheep. But here's another thing. As I was praying, as I was thinking about this, God didn't show me the sheep that ran away. He revealed to me 
What were the 99 doing? And one of the things that we can look at like this is, man, that sheep, what's to do with that sheep? Everyone goes through that stuff. That's ridiculous. But man, why would they leave? But what about the 99? I love that Jesus would leave that to go and, and search after the one, the hurting, the lost, the broken. And I was thinking about this, and I'm no theologian or anything like that. But I'm like, man, I can be like the 99 sheep and just not do anything about it as well. I can just sit in my pen. I can just be at youth. I can just be in my Christian bubble. And I can just, man, be all together with my Christian friends. And I can just stay here where it's safe and where everyone thinks the same. And I know it doesn't specifically say it, but I'm just pointing out like a different view here. What if the 99 actually went with Jesus as well? What if? What if the 99 went, you know what? This is not the same unless they are here. This does not feel right unless they are with me. This is just not the same. I want them with me as well. This story highlights that Jesus would go after the lost, 100%. But man, sometimes I can identify as the 99. I'm okay with just sitting in this chair, going to youth every week. I'm okay with doing this over and over again. But what if I was to tell you tonight that there are lost people that are right out there, that there are people that don't know Jesus, that there are people that don't know the light, that there are people that need a healing, that there's, there's people that need a Savior, that there's people out there that don't understand, that they feel too scared, that they don't know what's happening. But what if excess youth was like the 99, that instead of looking at the grass, they turned around and they looked outside and they said, you know what, I got friends in my class I got brothers and sisters. I got people that, that need to know that Jesus Christ is not a boss, but He's a brother. I, I know that there's people in my life that need to hear the life transformating power of God. There are people in my life and I'm too busy looking at the grass. One of the things that I believe can stop it saved is we look at Jesus like a brother. But another thing, another thing that I believe stops it saved is... We, we just can't stop looking at the grass. We're just looking at the grass. My prayer for every single one of us tonight is no matter if you identify as the sheep that ran away or the sheep that's still in the pen, that you understand that Jesus will stop at nothing. Come on, let me tell you, Jesus will stop at nothing to get you in His arms. Jesus will stop at nothing to get you in His arms. I've got a couple of people I want to talk to right now. The first one is maybe you're here and you're identifying as a sheep that ran away because you see God as rules. Or maybe you're here and you're, man, Jesus is so good. I'm just sitting in this pen. And you've been looking at the grass for too long and you're saying, man, maybe it's time to look up. I'm a bit scared to talk about my faith at school. I'm a bit scared to talk about my faith with this person. I'm a bit scared to talk about faith on my social media. But maybe tonight you're saying, you know what? Me not being liked for a couple seconds is, a, you know, it's actually a bit of a price to pay to see someone walk into eternity. I've talked about two things that stop it saved. But let me talk about a couple of things that happen when you get saved, right? Let me talk about a couple of things that don't stop. One of the things that I believe that doesn't stop when you get saved, that just keeps on going on and on and on forever, is that I believe that once we experience Jesus for ourselves, maybe you're here tonight, you haven't experienced Jesus fully. I believe that the feeling of separation stops in the name of Jesus. Separation stops it saved. Come on, I want you to write that down. If you're taking notes right now, separation stops it saved. Because we've got Jesus Christ, man, that would go through any length to have you in His arms. Separation stops it saved. And the other thing is that I believe that stops it saved. Actually, if we can all stand up in this place. Our sentence stops it saved. What I mean by this is before Jesus came down, the price for sin was death. The price for how we were living was death. It was a punishment. 
if I can have the band up here with me as well, is I, I just love the when Jesus came down, he looked at our sentence. He looked at the thing that we deserved. He looked at the thing that we were living in and he said, no, 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 no. That stops it saved. That thing that deserved to be on you, the price for sin, the, the wage for death, the, all this stuff, the, all the stuff that was meant to be our sentence. Jesus looked at that sentence and he said, no, 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 no. That stops it saved. And what that means is it means that shame stops it saved. It means that the power of sin stops it saved. It means that the sentence that we deserved is no longer holding us back because guess what? It stopped at saved. When Jesus was on the cross, is He understood very well that we would make mistakes, that we would stuff up, that we would just want it all for ourselves. But He said, no, 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 no. That sentence, that thing that was meant to hold you back, lock you up, that stops it saved and I give you my life. It says in the Word that when we accept Jesus, we get life and life abundance. And I want the life and life abundance, but I don't just want it to stay in here. I want it to go out to my friends. I want it to go out to my family. One of the things that I want to get vulnerable with you guys before I pray is I am the first Christian in my immediate family. I got brought up an atheist. People that went to Seiko probably have heard this story as well. Uh, I, was, I was raised someone that didn't go to church, didn't understand the Bible. In fact, when I was in year six, I told everyone I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. And I actually went out of my way to prove they just didn't exist. I got into cosmology. I love space. I love all that stuff. And, and I started getting so deep into it that I just believed that there was no even a glimpse of a thought that Jesus could exist. There was this one week at school, one of my friends that I used to get up to a bit of mischief with, okay? Uh, he came back after a school holiday and he's just nice. And what teenage is nice? Weird. So he comes to school. Imagine this is my friend and he's just like, ooh. He didn't do that. And I'm like, what's the, what, what happened to you? What, what is going on? And he's like, hey man, I found Jesus. I'm like, where is he? <laughs> Jesus. He's like, no, I went to this youth conference and I turned my life around and Jesus like revealed himself to me and, and I'm thinking, this guy's crazy. Like, what's going on? Anyway, and then that night, I get a message on Facebook because Snapchat's evil. He messaged me on Facebook and he said, hey, bro, loved our chat today. Like, what is that? Who talks like that? He's my age. And I'm like, yeah, man, it was cool. And then he said, hey, I want you to come along to this youth thing. I'm like, okay. No, so I said no. Next day, he asked me again. Next day, he asked me again. He kept on asking me. And then on Friday, he's like, hey, man, I'm picking you up tonight. And I'm like, oh, okay, here we go. He pick, who's got, do you guys have like white vans for church? <laughs> Our church has white vans. We got, no, no, bear with me, okay. He picks me up in a white van. <laughs> so already I'm not up to the best night of my life. I'm thinking, okay, if I make it back, that's a good thing. We go to this thing, this conference thing, there's worship, people lifting their hands. And I was actually there with Mitch and we were sitting at the back and I'm like tickling people's hands as they got them up and all this stuff. And I'm like, what a weird place. Anyway, then one of my friends gets up that I haven't seen in years. And I remember him being like addicted to drugs, like doing all this crazy stuff. And he sits on this stool and he's like, Jesus set me free. Jesus healed my addiction. Jesus brought my family back. To he's saying all this stuff. And I'm thinking to that, I'm like, man, I can relate with this. Like, what's the deal? What's the deal? What's the deal? And he's like, all I had to do was just accept him into my heart. And my life has never been the same since. In a room similar to this size, I was the only one that went out the front that night, received prayer, and my life has never been the same since. What would happen if my friend stayed in the pen? What would happen if my friend stopped it saved? What would happen if my friend was like, no, nah, no, nah, this is so good for me. This is amazing for me, but I'm not going to share it with anybody else. This is mine. What would happen if my friend stopped it saved? Can I encourage you not to stop it saved because there's people that need you. There's a generation that needs a voice that stands up for Jesus Christ. There's a generation that doesn't want to stand for gossip anymore. There's a generation that doesn't want to stand for shame anymore. There's a generation that's crying out for people to not stop it saved. Can we all close our eyes all over this place right now?